Okay, welcome everybody uh, to this next segment, this Digging Deeper Talk from the Theology of the Body Educators. We are very blessed today to hear from Kathleen Corey from Texas. She is actually the, the founder of TOB Educators, um, and I've been very blessed to, to get to know Kathleen over the past few years. Um, she lives in Texas. And she is a mother of six. I'll give a short, short introduction for Kathleen, and then Kathleen, you can fill in the, the gaps of what I'm missing for people. Um, she's very passionate about theology of the body. She's certified from the Theology of the Body Institute um, in Pennsylvania. And she currently works full time for Rua Woods, which makes um, school curriculum for theology of the body for the classroom for children of, of all ages. Um, so I, I'm very happy uh, to hear from Kathleen and I think you'll be blessed. Thank you all for coming. Um, and let's start with a prayer. And then Kathleen, if I miss something about your introduction, please, please fill us in. All right. Um, so let's pray. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, I want to pray this prayer is the theology of the body educator prayer prayer before teaching. Almighty ever living triune God eternal love and communion help us by your grace to hold firm as you carve us into your instruments for spreading the beautiful teaching of the theology of the body. Holy Spirit. Let the same breath that inspired our teacher and sainted Holy Father, St. John Paul II, breathe in us and through us, your humble instruments, teachers and sharers of the theology of the body, so that your people hear the music of Eden flowing through human history, attuning them to the resounding echo you have implanted within their being. May we share generously the wisdom that was given to us by St. John Paul II, we humbly ask for protection upon ourselves and those we teach. Let no darkness nor evil overcome what you desire to sing through us as we teach. Help each of us to become more and more authentically human and who you have called us to be, so that with one song, all humanity may one day exalt you with one gift of true love and freedom. Through Christ our Lord and our love. Amen. Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Well, thank you very much. If everyone could mute their um, microphones just so that we can have, uh, we don't have any background noise um, and everyone could hear, that would be great. Great. Um, and then um, one other request, I'm just always curious as to where everyone is from. I think it's just incredible that uh, people join from across the world. So if you would put in the chat, where you are, um, that would be wonderful as well. Um, and I will get started. Um, I gotta share my screen though. Oh, there it is, I lost it. Okay, can everyone see that? Okay. No, I can't see your screen, Kathleen. You can't see it? Mm -mm. Nope. Okay. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's so great uh, to be here. Nick, I think you did a fine job introducing me. Um, I am coming to you from Texas, so it's morning here. I guess in other places it might not be morning. Um, but what we're going to talk about today is Christian anthropology and why it's important for our students. Um, if you're not a teacher, um, you can just say, uh, why is it important for my own children, grandchildren, really um, for the world? So uh, let's just dig right in here. I always like to start with my family because um, this is my primary vocation um, is to be married and uh, to raise up these children. My daughter, Anna, is in the middle there. She just recently got married in December. And this is our whole family picture from that wedding. Um, so to the far left is our son, Aaron, who is a senior at Military Academy at West Point. And then next to him is my oldest son, Austin's wife, uh, Katie, holding my 
first grandchild, Coulter. I know some of you are grandparents and it's just such an exciting um, time. They live seven doors down. Please keep Austin in your prayers. He just deployed with the military. So um, if you do that, I would really appreciate it. And the next to him is my husband, Clayton. We've been married 28 years. And then Connor, our new son-in-law and Anna, me, and then my daughter, Abigail, who is a sophomore at Texas A&M University. Amelia, who's our little treasure, who's the last one at home. She's in the seventh grade. And then Jack um, is at Texas State, and he's going to graduate in May as well. So that's my people. And then because you have to see a picture of my grandchild in the blue bonnets, there is Coulter last Easter. So that's more than a year ago now. Okay. So why should we study Christian anthropology? Why is it important? That's what we're going to dig into today. Um, Pope Paul VI uh, in the 1960s said this, it is the whole man and the whole mission to that which he is called that must be considered both its natural earthly aspects and its supernatural eternal aspects. So in other words, we can't split the body and the soul. If we're going to study biology, we need to study the theology, right? We have to understand that there's something more than just matter. Uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church says, man, though made of body and soul, is a unity. So we are a unity of body and soul as human persons. John Paul II would call it an adequate anthropology. So as Nick said, of course, I studied theology of the body. So uh, that will be much of what this presentation um, concerns. So the theology of the body is a biblical study of our Christian anthropology. Um, he delivered it in a series of 129 Wednesday audiences um, over the course of five years. Um, a lot of times when you say the words theology of the body, people just raise their eyebrows and just don't understand anything about what you're saying. Um, and so it's important that we continue to talk about this. Our bodies do have a theology. They have meaning. And that's what we need to make sure the world understands. So the theology of the body, um, John Paul II Essentially, he answered two questions. He answered the question, who am I? And how do I live my life in a way that brings happiness? John Paul II knew that we had forgotten who we are. And we're going to talk a little bit more about John Paul II in a minute. But he looked at the world around him and knew that we didn't know who we are, created in the image and likeness of God. Um, because of many things that he saw going on in his life, uh, Nazism, communism, and the sexual revolution. Um, and in those, all those isms, we were essentially separating the body from the soul. So I like to ask this question, what is secular culture's view of the body? Does secular culture look at the body as an icon? So something that should draw our hearts and minds to God or an idol, something that we worship in and of itself? Is the, is the body an icon or an idol? And we could translate to say, is secular culture's view of the body good or bad? And then we could ask the question, what about the church's view of the body? Is the body an icon, something that should draw our hearts and minds to God, or an idol, something that um, just draws our hearts and minds to that thing itself? And again, we could ask the question, is it good or bad? So the church in the catechism of the Catholic church says this about the body. The flesh is the hinge of salvation. We believe in God who is creator of the flesh. We believe in the word made flesh in order to redeem the flesh. We believe in the resurrection of the flesh, the fulfillment of both the creation and the redemption of the flesh. So. There is some sort of misunderstanding in our culture about what the church thinks about the body. The church does not teach that the body is bad. And we can see that from this quote from the catechism. But what does that mean? What does it mean to say that the flesh is the hinge of salvation? What does hinge mean? Hinge as a noun means to attach or join or depend entirely upon. So how does our salvation depend entirely on the flesh? That is a bold statement, particularly in our culture. Well, John Paul II said, through the fact that the word of God became flesh, 
the body entered theology through the main door. So, of course, in the book of Genesis, it states that everything God created is good and the human person very good. But somehow we've gotten the idea that after the fall, our bodies are no longer good, just our souls, if we are spiritual. Enough. But we need to understand that we have a redeemer who came in the flesh to redeem the flesh, according to the catechism. But of course, that is not all. John Paul II, in what many consider to be the thesis statement of the theology of the body, said this. The body, in fact, and only the body, is capable of making visible what is invisible, the spiritual and the divine. It has been created to transfer into the visible reality of the world, the mystery hidden from eternity in God, and thus to be a sign of it. So John Paul II knew that the body not only isn't bad, but it has meaning. He knew that it was not just some sort of birdcage to, ho to house our soul, but the body itself has meaning. And so, therefore, he wrote this theology of the body. Our bodies have meaning and purpose. They teach us about the invisible God whose image we were made in. John Paul II also said in the theology of the body, the body is not, contrary to Plato, only temporarily linked with the soul as its earthly prison, as Plato mentioned, but that together with the soul, it constitutes the unity and integrity of the human being. So let's talk a little bit about John Paul II, because I think it's important to have an understanding of John Paul II in order to really understand where he's coming from in the theology of the body. John Paul II was born May 18th in 1920 in Poland, uh, and his name was Karol Wojtyla. Um, he grew up, um, his parents were Amelia and Carol, um, and he had an older brother and an older sister. Um, his sister died as a baby, and then his mother died uh, when he was eight. His brother died when Carol was 12. Um, he was a doctor and had gotten scarlet fever. And then he and his dad moved to Krakow uh, for Carol to go to college. Before he finished a year of college, the Germans bombed the Polish cities in 1939, and the Nazis closed the university. Um, they wanted to rid Poland of all its higher education. Um, only trade skills were allowed. Um, he worked at a quarry and then a chemical factory doing manual labor. And then his father died of a heart attack. Um, and so Carol had lost his entire immediate family by the time he was 21. Um, World War II ended three years later, um, and it went from the Nazi regime to the Soviet to Soviet communism. So there were secret accusations against um, Catholics, uh, Jews. There was violence against human dignity. There was a wiping away of Polish history and identity, and there was an oppression of the Catholic Church. During this time, Carol was determined to keep the identity of Poland alive. He uh, was part of a secret underground theater to keep alive the Polish history and tradition. Um, and he did this even risking deportation to Nazi death camps. He became a priest after his father died. He earned two doctorates, became a professor of ethics, <clears throat> and then he was ordained Bishop of Krakow in 1964 and a Cardinal in 1967. <clears throat> John Paul II loved human love. He studied it. He took young people on retreats in nature and talked to them about it. He saw the destruction of the human person, particularly the body, during World War II and then in the sexual revolution. He knew that we have forgotten who we are, and he wanted to help us understand who we are and what it means to be human. John Paul II's whole life demonstrated this love of humanity and this desire to help us understand who we are and help us to try to live uh, in this image that we were created. <clears throat> this is a photo of him uh, visiting the person who attempted to assassinate him um, in prison. In a letter to a uh, Jesuit cardinal, John Paul II said, the evil of our times consists in the first place in a kind of degradation indeed in a pulverization of the fundamental uniqueness of each human person. So let's go back to this quote uh, really quickly. Um, our bodies make visible something that is invisible. 
something spiritual and something divine. What does this mean as we begin to unpack this? What spiritual divine thing does our body make visible? Is it God? How does our body make God visible? In his book about theology of the body, Father Thomas Loya said, the theology of the body is the great mystery of how the invisible is made visible through the physical. What spiritual divine thing does our body make visible? In the theology of the body, it says, the creator seems to halt before calling him into existence. So it's speaking about when God was about to create the human person. He seems to halt and he says, let us create man in our image, in our likeness. So I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but one of the creation stories actually uses the word our image, our likeness. So how are we in the image and likeness of God? So to answer that question, first, I think we need to discuss who is God. One of my favorite quotes from um, the catechism is this. It says, God himself is an eternal exchange of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he has destined us in, to share in that exchange. So God is a communion of persons. What does that mean? What does it mean to say he's an eternal exchange of love? Well, in my uh, time of studying theology of the body, the best way I've heard that unpacked is this. You have God the Father who is eternally pouring out his love to his son. And his son is eternally receiving this love from God the Father and eternally pouring it back. So we have this eternal exchange of love being poured out and received and poured out and received. And St. Augustine would say that the love between the Father and the Son that is eternally being poured out is the person of the Holy Spirit. So we have this beautiful exchange of love that is continuous, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And somehow we were created to image that love. We are made in that image and likeness and our bodies and only our bodies make the spiritual divine God visible. So sometimes it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around that and what exactly that means. How does that happen? We cannot know who we are unless we are in this communion, unless we make a gift of ourselves, right? We have to image this by pouring our own selves out as a gift, by receiving others as gift, right? And then we can image God in some way. The quote goes on to say that we are destined to share in this exchange. In order to share in this eternal exchange of love, we must be open to and see and recognize where God is pouring himself out to us. Then we must receive that gift and pour ourselves out as gift back to him. And what does that look like? It's different for each of us. And we each have to discover what that means. In the theology of the body, it says man through his own humanity is set into a unique, exclusive, and unrepeatable relationship with God himself. In the garden, Adam found himself alone with the animals. And, you know, after that, right, God said it is not good for him to be alone. But first, before God creates Eve, he has Adam name the animals. During this naming, there is this recognition of Adam that he is not the same as the animal. Somehow he is different. And one of those things that makes him different is that he has this relationship with God before Eve is even created. There is this relationship. And I think that's one of the things that we have to remember is that this relationship comes first. Before we have a communion with others, we have this communion with God. And it's essential to our um, to having good relationships with others is having that good relationship with God. So we have to look for this relationship. We must be open to God and look for his invitation and respond to it. I'll share a little bit of how I think God speaks to me, but understand each of us were created for this unique, exclusive, and unrepeatable relationship with God in our own individual person. So God may speak to you in a different way um, then he speaks to me and we have to ask God, we have to take that to prayer and really enter into what God has for us. So one of the ways personally that I feel connected to God 
um, is nature. Um, I'm one of those pull over to the side of the road and take a picture of the sunset kind of girls. You know, this is a sunset in my hometown. That's my daughter. And we saw it and we just had to pull over and and jump out and uh, just really swim in it. You know, it's it's a it's a type of thing for me that, you know, you just really feel this communion with God. You want to just be as much of a part of it as you can. And so nature does that for me, particularly um sunrises, sunsets, you know, even like the flowers in my garden right now just bring me this great joy and connection to God. Um, the first time I really felt uh, something as a real communion with God, um, I was just at a youth conference when I was a teenager and I was in the back and there was, you know, music playing. And all of a sudden I just felt my heart just, you know, explode with love. And I realized that it's not the band. It's not the music. I'm like this is God entering into my heart. Um, and so we really have to be open to those moments and be available for those moments where God wants to uh, really avail himself in, in a particular way to us um, and be open to receive that gift, each of us in our own uniqueness. So I encourage you, if you've never done this, to just ask God, how does God speak to me? Um, does he speak to me through nature, right? Does he, do you see this giving and receiving this gift exchange everywhere? Um, thinking about a fly, flower or, you know, a shell or the beauty of math, you know, somebody made this using math, which, you know, I'm kind of an engineering nerd, so I love math as well. But of course there's music. Um, there's lots of different ways, you know, some people um, hear God a lot different ways than I do, but those are just some of the ways that God speaks to me. Um, this relationship with God must happen before we can have good relationships with others. We have to fill our longing for this infinite. Remember, God is this eternal exchange of love, continually pouring this out. And we long for that because we're creating that image. And if we try to suck infinity out of anything else, even these things that may bring us joy, right? um that are in my view icons um it's not going to work right we have to realize that this is god speaking to us and realize that this infinite eternal love can only be received from god himself otherwise it's like trying to you know suck infinity out of a pacifier uh, when we're really longing for this you know true drink so i encourage you to do that um if you can so Let's continue on with the theology of the body and the Christian anthropology question. So back to this quote, the body, in fact, and only the body is capable of making visible what is invisible, the spiritual and the divine. So what is the greatest analogy that scripture and tradition give us for the relationship of Christ in the church? There are many analogies in scripture. There's the vine and the branches, the sheep and the shepherd, the hen and the chicks. But what is the one that is most commonly used the most times in scripture. It's marriage, the bride and the bridegroom. Marriage is the most commonly used analogy for the relationship of Christ in the church. In the theology of the body, John Paul II says, man becomes an image of God, not so much in the moment of solitude as in the moment of communion. So in Ephesians, uh, Paul says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, and I mean in reference to Christ in the church. So marriage is supposed to teach us something about the relationship of Christ in the church, and particularly the one flesh union is supposed to teach us something about the relationship of Christ in the church. Marriage is the best analogy of our bodies making visible the invisible eternal exchange of love. Husband and wife give themselves to others to the other as a total gift. And this gift bears fruit in a new life. In Gaudium et Spes, which is the document written after Vatican II, it says man cannot fully find himself except through a sincere gift of, of himself. Because we are imaging God, who is a total gift, right? In this eternal exchange, we see that he is pouring himself out to the son and the son is receiving him. But we also see when Jesus came here, he made a total gift of himself to us with his life, right? 
um, for our salvation. So if we are to image that, um, then we must be a gift and we cannot find who we are except through this sincere gift. This is played out over and over, even in popular movies and music. You see it all the time. Think about your favorite movie. Most likely there is a part of the movie where someone is called upon to, in some way, sacrifice themselves for the good of the other, to die to self to save someone else. Just think about the greatest showman. Philip runs into the burning building to save Anne. Uh, in Moana, Maui sacrifices his hook, the item he thought gave him his identity, to help Moana. In Spider-Man No Way Home, Peter in the end has to make a gift of himself in order to save the universe. We see it over and over. We cannot know who we are without making a gift of ourselves. So why do we need to teach our students about this? Why do we need to teach our children um, and our grandchildren and our friends? Well, if we don't understand who we are as persons created in the image and likeness of God to be gift, what happens? We begin to believe our bodies are meaningless. Our lives are meaningless. We are broken and the communion with others becomes difficult. Usually when I do a talk like this, I like to pull up um, popular songs. Sometimes I'm pleasantly surprised and see that, you know, there's a popular song that actually has a good message. But many times a song like this is popular and our students, our children, society is inundated with lyrics like this. This was the number one song as of January 9th, 2023. Um, I'm just going to read some of the lyrics really quick. Um, the last paragraph here, I might kill my ex, not the best idea. His new girlfriend's next. How'd I get here? I might kill my ex. I still love him, though. I'd rather be in jail than alone. This is the kind of songs that our students, our children, our the society is listening to. Um, and it's really very tragic. It's very, very sad. Um, this is someone who has decided that if this person um, doesn't love her anymore, that she just thinks it's best to kill them. Um, and this is really, really tragic. Um, but what if our students knew that the body is not an idol? What if they knew um, the truth about who they were as human persons? What if they knew their body is an icon that is supposed to teach others about God, that we are creatures and when we look upon the body of another human person, it should remind us of the creator. What if they knew that another human person is not their ultimate satisfaction, that their bodies are holy and meant to teach us who God is, who loves us totally and completely? I'm going to skip the rest of the lyrics, but it's a very sad, sad thing when you start to look up um, lyrics of the number one song. So what we know is that without the creator, if we don't know God, the creature vanishes. If we don't understand this concept of gift, if we don't accept that we are creatures, that our bodies are meaningful gifts to, from, of the creator, then we sink into a world of meaningless grasping for momentary pleasure instead of lives lived on the road to heaven. A grasping at whatever we can get instead of an openness to receive all that our creator has to give us. We don't become who we are created to be, we vanish. But there is hope. <laughs> there is an echo of who we are in each of us an echo of original innocence, this understanding of who we were created to be before the fall, this longing to be loved and to love, to be a gift, to receive others as gift. John Paul II knew this. He wanted to make sure that we knew it too, especially young people. So we knew that after the rupture, um, there were four relationships that were broken. The relationship between God and man was broken. The relationship between um, the human, human persons, so Adam and Eve, that relationship was broken. Um, the rel relationship between um, the human person and nature was broken. And then the relationship within body and soul was broken.
this image is very meaningful to me. This is a piece of art that was, if you look closely, it was built in the middle of a desert. Um, but to me, it's, it's a sad picture, but it's also a joyful picture because it shows that there is hope within, right? That there is this original innocence, uh, the innocence of a child that was, that is within us, that knows the truth of the human person that longs for this communion with others, despite the brokenness that we might feel in our world. And John Paul II knew that about us. Um, and he knew that, you know, scripture teaches us about this, um, but maybe not in uh, a per particular way that people really could understand uh, the truth of the human person. So after the original sin, man and woman were to lose the grace of original innocence. This discovery of the spousal meaning of the body, this meaning that is gift, that we were created to be a gift and to receive others as gift. Um, this discovery of the spousal meaning of the body was to cease being for them a simple reality. Yet this meaning was to remain as a task. So we have this task, right, to understand who we were created to be before the fall and to reach for that original innocence with this distant echo in our hearts. John Paul II would tell young people and really all people, you are not who they say you are. Let me remind you of who you are. John Paul II knew this when he went to Poland in 1979. He knew that the people needed to be reminded of who they were, unique, unrepeatable, irreplaceable gifts, human persons who image their creator. John Paul II said to the youth at World Youth Day in Toronto, we are not the sum of our weaknesses and failures. We are the sum of the Father's love for us and our real capacity to become the image of his son. These are the messages our students and children and grandchildren need to hear. And if we don't tell them, who will? We are icons in, created in the image and likeness of God to be gift. When we look at another human person, we should be reminded of God, their creator. God builds the spiritual on the natural. He teaches us about what we can't see using what we can see. We cannot know who we are unless we make a gift of ourselves because God is the gift exchange. In order to share the eternal exchange of love, we must see, look for, recognize where God is pouring himself out to us. Then we must receive that gift and pour ourselves out as a gift back to him. Our st students need to know that their bodies are holy, that they have meaning, that they are not objects to be used, but persons to be loved. They need to see themselves and every other human person as a gift. We teach them that by teaching them Christian anthropology in ways that helps them internalize what they are learning. They need to see the truth of it in themselves and in the world around them. In conclusion, your body matters. It is holy. It is an icon of the eternal exchange of love. It teaches you and others about who God is. We must treat it as an icon and treat everyone else around us as icons as well. We must open our eyes to how God speaks to us. We must receive what he has for us. He does love us and he wants us to be happy. Seek him, find him, receive yourself and others as a gift and find out how you are to pour yourself out as a gift so that you can know who you are as unique, exclusive, unrepeatable gift and have the eyes to see each and every human person as a unique, unrepeatable, irreplaceable gift as well. And then pass that on to your students and children. And that's my contact information if you want to contact me personally. And that is all.